Irish history is a great way to look through the ages. It's a unique way to examine European identity and an important window into the soul of Western civilization. We can use the Annals of the Kingdom of Ireland to do this because it was compiled by the Four Masters as a year-by-year -year account of our nation's development from the Neolithic age into the modern period. The Four Masters chronicled Irish history from 4000 BC to the time of the European Renaissance. This video dives into that history and presents the lineage of Irish kings and queens from the earliest record up to the age of the great King Brian. Our story will begin in a mythological Neolithic setting when poetry and metaphor explain phenomena that we can also understand through sociology and scientific analysis. In this beginning, I will mention some of the Daedanian gods and goddesses of the Gaelic pantheon and Celtic mythology and Irish literature, but I will leave greater detail to future videos. After Greek and Latin, Irish or Gaelic literature is the oldest written record in European letters. Irish literati built schools across Europe and were instrumental in helping other European nations to develop national literature in their own languages. In fact, the oldest writing system in the world, older even than the cuneiform of Sumeria, is European. As seen on the Tartaria tablets, the Vinca culture created writing as long ago as 5500 BC. The Irish trace our origins to this breadbasket of Europe in the Ukraine. And our oldest writing, called Agam, or Om, uses similar patterns, as a matter of coincidence at least. Agma, the Daedanian god of Irish writing, is the perfect character to introduce the history of Irish kings. The primal goddess of Ireland gave her name to the island. Known as Eru, she is a female trinity goddess. She is invoked throughout the centuries and is cherished by every generation of Irish to this very day. Irish basically means the people of the goddess Eru, and our island is called Era, or Ireland, the homeland of her people. Wishnach is the uh, central navel of Ireland, the spiritual center. Angus is the Irish god of love. He's the son of Dahada, the great father god of the Irish tribes, and of Boan, the bovine mother goddess associated with the Milky Way. A map of the galaxy is found in Ireland on the Boyne Valley named for her. It is here that Angus makes his home at Bruna Bona, the womb of Boan. The central love story of the Gaelic pantheon in Irish literature is called the Dream of Angus and describes the romance of Angus and his lover Caer. The basic metaphysics of this mythology conjures the music of love as Angus's blessed head is haloed by birds flying and singing. The great romances of Irish literature develop from this metaphysic and become a religion of romance across Europe, which we call Arthurianism. Romanticism is the European metaphysic that defines European Christianity as a balance between pagan pleasure and civilized responsibility. Returning to the chronology of the Four Masters, we begin dating the history of Irish families with the arrival of Kessar to Ireland in 2958 BC. This is how Irish historiography begins because she is accompanied by a tribe of women and by the cultural steward and archetypical druid Fintan MacBokra, who becomes the immortal witness of Irish history from this definitive date of arrival. Fintan the Immortal begins Irish history with a conversation, which is the first stage play in Irish literature. This is called the Colloquy of the Ancients, or the Akal of Neshanorach, where the Druid debates the Hawk of Achill about events unfolding over the centuries. We take up their history as fellow witnesses year by year. This is in essence the Irish Genesis. I will mention Ladra and Banva as the first woman and first man of the Irish people, but leave that debate alone. Instead, we consider this Neolithic period through the telling of the four masters who tell us in the epic Laur Gobala Aaron that the next 
arrival to Neolithic Ireland was Partholon, who led the Partholonians, and that the first war was had in 2760 BC against the Fomorians. The Irish word foer means harvest, and the Fomorians may be the first agriculturalists in Ireland. They may also be the Sea Peoples, possibly the megalithic builders, whilst the Partholonians innovate further. At this time, however, Irish history is not confined to the happenings in Ireland alone. The four masters also describe simultaneously the history of the Gaelic people who at this time live in the Ukraine. The Gaelic tradition is a pre-Christian mystery religion, and the language that comes from that has a deep connection to all the ancient civilizations. That's why we introduced the Gaelic people with the great warrior poet of the Ukraine, Phineas Farsid, a collector of world wisdom who syncretized 72 cultures into one genius in the time of the pharaoh Canaris, who also had a daughter. This pharaoh's daughter, Skota, would give her name to the Scottish people, which is another name for the Irish. She married Phineas's son, Nail when they left the Ukraine and entered Egypt. Skota and Nail had a son named Guidel Gloss, who then invented the Gaelic language and mystery school, giving the Irish yet another name, the Gaels or Gaelic people. The Irish are named for Eru, the goddess of Ireland, for Skota, the pharaoh's daughter, for Phineas as the Fenians, a name also given to Finn McCool, and Gaelic or the Gaels, in honor of Guidel Gloss, the inventor of Celtic languages, whom the four masters tell us led his people sojourning in Egypt sometime around 2600 BC. At this same time that the Gaelic people are emerging from Egypt into the Mediterranean world, the Partholonians are in Ireland. This is where we meet Partholone's nephew, Tuan MacCarroll, the next druid to emerge in Irish tradition. Like Fintan MacBolchra, he is an immortal witness to history, and he witnesses the coming to Ireland of the Nemedians, a name which means the Holy Ones. So Ireland in the 27th century BC is inhabited by druids and Holy Ones, as the Gaelic people enter into the Mediterranean, and Goedal Gloss's son becomes the king of Crete. This is the Gaelic tradition's claim to ancient mystery religions in the Ukraine, Sumeria, Egypt, and now Minoa and Mycenae. Archaeology confirms a confluence between Ireland and the Bronze Age Mediterranean. This is a statue from Keros, depicting a king playing the harp. The tribal father god of the Irish, Dahida, also plays a, a magic harp called the Anuna. Esru then had a son named Aber Scott, the grandson of Guidel Gloss, who leads the Gaelic people out of the Mediterranean and back into Europe where he reclaims the Ukraine. It is here that the Gael will live according to the four masters for five generations. Archaeology confirms something like this history in the spread of the Celtic people or Celts across Europe. Bronze Age of Ireland, the Firbolg Bronze Age. Um, here's an artifact from the period, uh, the Bally Camin Lanula. The first high king in Ireland at this Firbolgian period uh, was uh, Slanga, whose name uh, gives us a uh, slain castle where the famous music festival was held. As the first high king of Ireland, uh, his reign began in 1934 BC, according to the Four Masters. Now, outside Ireland, uh, Aber Scott's descendants uh, left the Ukraine and conquered uh, Sweden in a place called uh, Gothia. And uh, in fact, goth or gothic uh, means in Irish uh, voice. So the, the connection between the gothic and the Gaelic is, according to the four masters, it, it comes from this period when uh, the first king of Gothia, the first Gaelic king of Gothia, uh, Law Find, which means the bright hand, 
conquered uh, Sweden and established a Gaelic kingdom there that would last for many generations. While the history of Ireland is taking place, the history of the Gaelic people is taking place in Sweden. In Ireland, we have the the last Firbolg king, who's the husband of Taltu, who, who we'll mention now in a minute, uh, Jokud Mac Ark. Uh, he's the first lawgiver in Irish history. And he's the, the grandson of, of Slanga, who we met earlier. And you can visit his grave, actually, uh, near Moitura in, in County Galway. It's called Yoki's Cairn. Um, he, his wife is Taltu. This is a medal that um, was the Olympic medal of the Irish Olympics that was uh, reconstituted by Yates. Um, she was the foster mother of Lou, who's the... Um, the, the, the god of uh, Irish renaissance or, or arts and um, the Telton games are um, are those games where poets and athletes and musicians compete for medals and this was one of the medals so that depicts Teltu the high queen of Ireland in 1907 BC in, in Sweden where the Gaelic uh, people are at this period um, the king there is uh, Data, or, and he's the uh, the last Gaelic king of uh, Sweden, um, who uh, then initiates a a trek from Sweden uh, to Ireland. They have a vision that the Gaelic people will uh, inherit Ireland, and uh, they first land in uh, Portugal, uh, which is which means port of the Gael. And uh, the the first Gaelic king there in Iberia is Brathaus. This is a statue of his son Brogan, or Brohan, who was the Gaelic ruler of Iberia. They had conquered it temporarily. They were there for only a couple of generations, and the and the Gaels infused their name into the name Portugal, which. And Galicia, which his son Billa will see the completion of the prophecy that the Gaelic people had in Sweden that uh, Ireland was their destined uh, homeland for all time. And now his name is interesting because Billa is the name of the uh, sacred tree which defines a community. So in the middle of every village would be a maypole or a Billa tree. In fact, village uh, connected to each other, Billa and village. This is the beginning now of uh, Gaelic Ireland, which which happens when Miles the Gael uh, leads his people to Ireland. He doesn't make it, but his sons will become the king, the first Gaelic kings of Ireland. So Gaelic Ireland, according to the Four Masters, begins in 1700 BC with Miles the Gael. Now the his he's a very important figure, uh, genealogy and and surnames. So the Irish think of themselves as the people of Eru, which is where the word Irish comes from. Fenians comes first from Fenius Farsid, who we met back in the Ukraine, uh, or later Finn McCool. Um, the Gael will be the, the name of the Gaelic people, the Gaelic speaking people, coming from the name Gwydal Gloss, the, um, the son of uh, Skota, who gives us the name Scottish, uh, which means Irish. And and now uh, Malasius or Miles, who who gives the Irish the name Milesian or the Mil Milesians. His sons become the the first Gaelic kings of Ireland. As I said, the coming of the Gael is is in its own regard a saga. The Dedanian Gaelic gods from the the pantheon uh, will take uh, the place as the gods of these Gaelic people. So the the, the Gaelic arrivals will uh, come to view the Daydanan gods as their their own gods and and Gaelic culture will be defined as the synthesis of the Gaelic language and the pre-existing pantheon of Tara and the first uh, king at Tara the son of Miles will be Eremon which means the devotee of Eru and he's the Ardri Naharan, or the High King of Ireland, and his reign begins in 1700 BC. He's the husband of Taya, for whom Tara is is named. So the first high, first Gaelic High Queen of Ireland is named is basically named Tara, or Taya. 
Uh, she's the Ard Ban Rian the Heron. Tara, which is the capital of ancient Ireland, or the Olympus, where the gods lived and where the kings will rule from, is uh, named for her. Now, this is a, a map of the spiritual centers of Ireland. Uh, Taya Mar, which is the Tara, is in, in the middle. And then to the north is Armagh, Eamon Macha, in Ulster. Um, to the south is uh, Cashel, is the, or Dinring, is the, um, the capital of Munster. Connacht is, is ruled from uh, Cruachan, which will become uh, Croke Patrick, or near Croke Patrick. Ratha Crowen in in Connacht and in Leinster, Naka Allen is the is the capital, the ancient capital, or Dún Alanna. It's a quincunx. Uh, the, Seamus Heaney, the the great Irish poet, in the twentieth century, will describe this spiritual quincunx uh, of Ireland in uh, modern poetry. The Aramin's brother Aber Finn becomes the next king. Um, uh, the, we're just skipping through the, the, the lineage of the kings. Uh, the, the next king, uh, Tirna Moss, or Tiger Moss, he's a descendant through Eremon, and at the Battle of uh, Enoch Macha, uh, wrestled the high kingship from Aberfin. His rule is, is from 1621 to 1544 BC, and he's the first uh, initiate of the Tartan. So the uh, the Tartan, which is how the tribes of of the Gaelic people um, differentiated themselves, each each tribe had their own. The first Tartan was dyed uh, purple, blue, and green. Another high king, uh, Dun Severic Castle in County Antrim, uh, Saberka, who's the king Ardri and the Heron at the time, 1533 BC. Um, he's the first high king to come from the northern part of uh, in Ulster. His, his brother ruled from down MacPatrick uh, near Kinsale in County Cork. The next high king, uh, Satan Art. Many high kings between this one and, and the last, but you can, he's the high king from 1358 to 1353 BC. Uh, he died in a single combat at Cruachan in Connacht, defending the life of his son who succeeded him. Cruachan here is the capital of Connacht. Um, his son, Fiachu uh, Finscohach, which means a raven of the finest vine, Ardri Naharan, uh, returned to avenge his father's death, uh, return with a black fleet, uh, reclaim the, the throne of the high kingship. Uh, the next high king, Munman, is the, the high king that introduced the, the neck torque. The next high king is also uh, the chief scholar of Ireland, Olive Fodla. The, the modern Irish word for professor is Olive. Ulster takes its name from Olive. So Ulster basically means the, the land of the, the scholarly people in, in Irish. And this is the man who is the namesake of that place. He instituted the Assembly of Tara, or the festival at Tara. You can still uh, find his throne. Uh, it's located in uh, Loch Crew, um, and it's a cairn or a, a stone seat and it's from this throne that the the legal code was promulgated this uh, next high king is Geda Olgahach Ga Gothic again means voice his his name means voice as sweet as the strings of a zither or a harp uh, also ruling in the 13th century BC 1231 is Fiechu Fenecus Findolkes which means the white hidden one. The wells were dug in his reign, and he founded uh, Kells. The first chariot in Ireland uh, arose with Rahakad Roha, which means the, the one who brought the wheel of the chariot, and uh, his reign is in 1031 BC. Uh, he's followed by the fair Nua de Finfoil, and coins are first introduced to Ireland in 893 BC with um, Eina Jarig. Coins were presented in that way, with notches on a, on a ring. Uh, Glenishine Gorget uh, shows you some of the jewelry that was worn in this period, 800s BC. The next high king, a major progenitor of Irish families in Munster, uh, Luga Lloyde, Luga Macdara is another name. Uh, he's the son of Dara, eponymous ancestor of the Dariana, which is a major uh, tribal confederation in Munster. He ruled in 738 BC. We'd say in this time that the well of Conla, 
uh, sprung. It's seen as the, the source of the seven rivers of Ireland. But it, it's more importantly uh, an oracle um, where the nine hazels of Crimmel the sage drop their fruits yonder under the well. They stand by the power of magic spells under the darksome mist of wizardry. Yeats described the well, um, which he encountered in a trance, as being the waters of emotion and passion in which all purified souls are entangled. Next high king, Aud Rua, uh, was uh, in 731 BC. His uh, kingship is remembered in a place called Asaro Falls in Bally Shannon, which is named for him. His daughter is Maka Mangrua, who um, would define Eamon Maka. Maka Mangrua was the High Queen of Ireland in 661 BC. She uh, wrestled the, the kingship for herself after her father was killed, and the waterfalls are named for him. She enslaved her uncles who committed the heinous deed and uh, defined the fort with uh, her neck brooch. Amen means neck brooch, and she drew the boundaries of Amen Macha uh, with that piece of jewelry. Uh, the, the goddess Macha uh, precedes from the Daedanian period. She's a Gaelic god of Tara. Um, she was known as the goddess of the Great Plain, or Macha. She was a triple goddess like Eru. Uh, Morigana means the, the Great Queen. Uh, the next high king is Uganamor. He, he was probably intermarried with uh, the royalty of of Gallic France. He's known as the um, foster son of Queen Maka Mangrua, and he married a Gallic princess from France named Kesser Krahach. Their children will become founders of uh, Irish counties. The next high king from Leinster, which is the area around Dublin, the tribes such as Kinsella, uh, the Offaly, the Kavanagh, the O'Byrne, the Fallon, the O'Toole, the O'Dwyer, the O'Murphy, the O'Dempsey's, the O'Farrells, the Branagh. In boyhood, he was known as Mon Olive, or the Mute Scholar, and the Book of Leinster holds the epic of his 30-year exile. The capital of Leinster, as I said before, is Dunalana, or Nakalan, in County Kildare. The next great scholar uh, and high king was Angus Olive, who ruled in 499 BC. And it's around this time that... Uh, that the Scottish monarchy starts to emerge in Ireland um, as the Irish uh, start to conquer the Western Isles of Scotland. This process will take much longer than this, but the, the ancestor of these expeditions was uh, named Fergus I, who uh, flourished some time in Ireland in around 300 BC. Uh, he, he's remembered in uh, Carrick Fergus, um, the Rock of Fergus, with his descendant many centuries later uh, will found the Dalriata, which will uh, conquer Scotland and begin the Gaelic uh, kingship there, which uh, persists in uh, many uh, clans there today. The next high king in 199 BC is Lugad Lunya, who's the uh, ancestor of the Yoganachta, or the Iganachta, one of his descendants of the O'Learys, who would found called the School of Ross in Cork, and actually kings of France would be educated there uh, in centuries to come. Following him is Nyasa, uh, the, the great queen of Ulster. She was the uh, the lover of the high king, Fachna Fahach, the wise, and she was uh, the mother of Connachbar Macnessa, um, who was important in the Tonbo Kulna. We're now in the last century of BC, a pagan era where the, the defining myth, the epic, the Tonbo Kulna, is a older Phoenician modeled religious work which describes the intergenerational conflict and resource conflict between raiders, the raiders of Kuli. So you see this in the in the word Bible, um, the Bible or the two bulls, is um, a, an older model for the conflict between father and son that you would see in the Jupiter Saturn conflicts between the Titans and the Olympians. This is an Irish version of that type of conflict. It's told in something like a soap opera. It begins with a the pillow talk of the queen of Connacht, Maeve, 
and, and her husband, Alil, as they discussed their resources and the resources of the neighboring kingdom of Ulster. Instead of retelling the, the, the epic here, we're going to stick to the four masters. So the war between Queen Maeve in Connacht and Conacher Macnessa in Ulster begins with this usurpation of her father. It's Shakespearean in that way. It's, it's a royal soap opera between different royal families. The next character we might introduce is Yoku Aram. Uh, he's the High King of Ireland from 131 to 116 BC. He calls all the princes and princesses of Ireland together for a festival at Tara, but they won't attend because he's unmarried. So the wooing of Etienne is his attempt to marry the most beautiful woman in Ireland. This High Kingship is then followed by Ether Scale Moor, who is the high kingship in the background of the Toyn Kulna as the princes and princess or Queen Maeve uh, battle. Etherscale Moore is married to Mas Buchla, whose biography can be found in on Ban Hianachas, the lore of women. She's the mother of the high king Conra Moore. So returning to the Toyn Kulna, so this is Queen Maeve, the princess of Connacht. She's married to Olil Macmata. Conacher Macnesa is in Ulster from the capital at Amenmacha. He's raised by the Druid Kabad. The saga of Deirdre of the Sorrows is another work of profound female literature in that Deirdre is a woman who flouts official rules so that she can be true to her own heart. So the woman in love is a higher law than the law itself. And she represents that as a martyr to that principle. It's a key principle in romantic European literature. And it comes directly from the Celtic canon of Irish and Gaelic literature. Another character from the Tonbo Kulna era is Brickru, who's a troublemaking poet, and he's famous for having hosted a feast of champions, and the two bulls trample him to death in the Tonbo Kulna. Intergenerational conflict of that epic is diagnosed by the authors of it as a ruinous waste of resources which uh, it's not an ostensible moral tale, but it is the underlying rationale. It, it also, in remembering the time, in the place names all around Ireland, there are memorials to the wars that were fought in this particular epic. The memorial becomes more powerful than the war itself. And the epic understanding of war, if done in a proper way, stops the need to repeat actual war. The great uh, defender of, of all Ireland's warriors, the greatest savior, is Cú Chulainn. His whole life is saga after saga from his childhood through his final years. Scahach is the shadow warrior woman from Gaelic Scotland where uh, Cú Chulainn goes uh, as a young man to learn the martial arts and she's associated with the Isle of Skye in the Fortress of Shadows called Dun Ska. Skahach means uh, shadowed, shadowed one. So the woman of the shadows. Um, the stealthness of the warrior. Aver or Aimer is Kuchalin's wife. And here, here she's depicted uh, in mourning for her, her dead lover. She was wooed by Kuchalin's coded poetry. So the idea of the warrior poet is also essential to the development and the ongoing history of modern Ireland. The Easter Rising of 1916 was also called the Poets Rebellion. It comes from this this older tradition of um, the warrior poet. Another character is Fair Diad um, He's the warrior of Connacht. He's also the best friend and foster brother of Cú 
he's made to fight Kuchalan, and this is the famous image of his death and the friendship between Kuchalan and Ferdiad. Another character is Kuri, and he appears uh, first in the literature in the episode known as the Trance of Amergine. Amergine is the great and first poet of the Gaelic Irish and the Ashlinge Namargine is is one of the poems associated with him. Amergine is, is very important also in that he defines the metaphysic of the Gaelic Irish as a, something like a pantheism. The coexistence of self and surroundings is seen in his the first poem ever composed in Ireland called The Song of Amergine. It's actually a metaphysic. Uh, it's totemic in its invocation of animal spirits. It's also the basis, as I said, of, of something like a, a Gaelic pantheism, which becomes philosophically the stance of the Celtic Christian church later in conflict with the Catholic norm uh, coming from Rome. Eregena, uh, arguably one of the greatest philosophers of the early Middle Ages is a testimony to the Irish understanding of nature, which can be seen uh, visually in the unique ornamentation of the Gaelic Irish. Ornamentation somehow achieves a three dimensionality and an organic quality whilst exploring mathematical principle. So it balances the imposition of logic and mathematics on nature. The antecedent to Erigena's philosophy could be seen in Amergine, as I was describing. As we leave this era of the Tonbo Kulna, we enter into the next, and uh, this means the birth of uh, Conor Amor, or Conor the Great, a high king of Ireland from 110 to 40 BC. He had a long and peaceful reign. His descendants are great and numerous and exist to this day uh, and can be found in Ireland and Scotland. The last Gaelic king of Scotland came from the line of Conor Amor and his name was Alexander III of Scotland. So Sean Connery would have been of the Shield Connery, a magnificent king uh, who has many sagas associated with him. Uh, one of those sagas involves Dervila, we're entering now into the last decade of the BC era. And uh, here we have uh, Cúchalan's foster son, Lug Rib Jarig. Uh, there's a saga involving the Leofal stone, uh, which is the famous coronation stone at Tara. The, the king of Ireland at the time of Christ's life, which is the marker between the BC and the AD, is a uh, Crimhin Nianor, and he's Ardri the Heron from 8 BC to 9 AD, a great voyage saga that he undertook with his aunt, another great female character from Irish literature. And this saga describes their search for uh, golden treasures, which included a chariot and a thick kale board, which is the Irish chess an embroidered cloak of gold, a sword that was inlaid with gold serpents, silver embossed shield, a spear, a sling which never missed its mark, two greyhounds connected with a silver chain. So that saga is associated with Crimhinnianar. And now we're in the AD era. This is Karbara Kinkat. He was the leader of an uprising of the subject peoples against the kingship. We're, he, we're followed by the res restoration of peace uh, when Faradach fin Fechtnach, the fair and blessed Ardri Neheran, High King of Ireland, uh, took the throne from 14 to 36 AD. His father had been overthrown by Karbara Kinkath, and whilst his mother was in exile, she was also pregnant with him, and he returned from there to regain the, the kingship. Um, during his reign, Moran McMahon lived, and he's a famous judge whose judicial prowess was understood in a metaphorical image or a tool, which is very useful to understanding the problem of guarantee in, in the judiciary. Uh, so it's said that the Id Moran 
uh, here's a depiction of such a collar, uh, the broider collar is an example of what the Idmoran might have looked like. This collar would be worn by the judge, and if the judge made a false judgment, the collar would squeeze his neck. And it's, it's an important image in the problem of justice, which is that who judges the judges. And so this image is, is very useful in, in illustrating that problem. The next uh, hiking we will mention is Fiatuk fin Makdara. He's the Ari Naharan from 36 AD. We now enter 76 to 106 AD. Uh, Tuhul Tektmar is Ardri Naharan. Um, he annexed territory from each of the four provinces, Ulster, Munster, Connacht, and Leinster, to create the royal province of Meath around Tara so that this would become the central plain. In his creation of Meath, he divides Meath itself into four sub-provinces, which means four hills, and each of the hills is the ceremonial arena for ceremonies that are attached to the calendar of Ireland also. So, so that Munster would be associated with the hill of Tlachtga, which is also associated with time on the calendar. So it's associated with Halloween or Samhain. Wishnach is associated with Bialtana on the calendar around May 1st, which is one of the high quarter days of the Irish calendar. Bialtana and Wishnach is associated with Connacht. The third is Taltu, and this is where Lunasa was celebrated. Lunasa is associated with August. And Tara is associated with the goddess Bridget because Bridget is celebrated at this time of the calendar around the festivals of Imbolc or St. Bridget's Day or as we know in uh, Bill Murray movies as Groundhog Day. The next high king is Fedlam Rechtmar, the judge or lawgiver, who is followed by Cahermor the Great, Ardri Neheran from 119 to 122 AD. His daughter, Kochran, was the mother of the Fenian hero, Dirmaj Uduvna, or Dermot, from the, the sagas of Dermot and Grania, who will meet them soon. And uh, he gave the hill of Almu uh, near Nakalin uh, to the druid Nuud. And this would become later the home of Finn McCool. And, and we're entering soon into this next period of epic with uh, Finn McCool. A new era of Finn McCool will soon arise as we get closer to the coming of St. Patrick. But we're still in a pagan period, so this is the, a, another great pagan period. And the great king of, of pagan Ireland at this time is Khan of the Hundred Battles. Um, in American popular culture, uh, he'll, his name will be associated with New York politicians. In the literature of Ireland, he's, he's the great king of this pagan era. His rule is from 122 to 157 AD. And it's in his reign that the hero Finn McCool is born. In that timeline, we meet Cool and Murna, who are the parents of Finn McCool. And so the story of their courtship is uh, it's, an, it's another complicated Shakespearean drama where you have a, a father who refuses a cool the hand of his daughter Morna and so they elope and this causes uh, vengeance um, so the, 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 her father is a druid so that's a bad enemy to have and he appeals to the high king Khan of the hundred battles to get this man and, and declare him outlaw. So uh, Morna is now in a predicament as she's pregnant with this outlaw's child. Uh, to give birth to the hero Finn McCool in the refuge of her lover's sisters. Finn McCool's aunt is a druid. Her other sister, Leah Luchra, are, who's a warrior woman, uh, will take the baby Finn McCool and they'll raise Finn McCool in the Schlieve Bloom Mountains 
in the wilderness, and they'll train him in druidry and martial arts. So Finn McCool, the great hero, is like Cú uh raised by extra talented uh, females, which is, which is a, a recurring theme in Irish literature. Later, as he grows up, instructed further by others, this is the leprechaun, or it could be thought of as a leprechaun, Finn Aikis, uh, who is a teacher of Finn McCool, and the famous story of the Bradon Fassa, or the Salmon of Knowledge, is associated with their tutelage. Innumerable sagas are associated with his life. He's th There's an image of him, uh, Finn heard far off the first notes of the fairy harp. He's as much a poet as a warrior, and he defines that balance of Irish masculinity that's not just demonstrated in rough arts, but also in the finer arts. The pursuit of Dermot and Gráinne, as mentioned, is, is another of the sagas associated with him. Also the birth of Oisín through Saif, his lover, and the rescue of Tara are just to name a few of the, the great works of literature or the sagas from the what's called the Fenian cycle, which is a great pagan mythology of Ireland uh, in this period. The 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 Toriach Dermada Agus Gráinne is an epic romance of uh, Irish literature from the Gaelic pantheon that provides what will become the template for European romantic literature. For Europeans, not just as literature and entertainment, but as something like a metaphysic. And, and I think of that as the, the woman's love is the higher law. It, it even breaks the code between the Fenians or the knights. So that Dermot, in loving Gráinne, is justified to love her, though it breaks his warrior code. Art Onfer is the next high king. Uh, Ardry in the Heron 165 to 195. As we get closer to the Christian era, we can move further on, meet Mac Khan, Ardry in the Heron from 195 to 225. His mother was Khan's daughter and uh, the princess Saiv, and his foster father was Olil Olam, the king of Munster. He defeated Art and was later defeated by Art's son Cormac, Olil Olav who's mentioned with Mac Khan, he divided the kingdom between his sons, Yogan Mor, Cormac Kos, and Kian. And uh, Yogan is seen as the, the patronym of the Yoganachta, or the Iganachta. And, and among the tribes associated with them are the O'Sullivan, described in Anlaur Muvnach, or the Book of Munster, the, the seat of Munster, the capital, uh, was erected by Kark. It's called the Rock of Cashel, and this would become the the court of the Yoganachta. And we're we're in this pagan period still, and uh, Cormac MacArt, the great and wise Ardri in the Heron from 226 to 66 A.D. He was a wise king and author of the Councils of Cormac. He was also the builder of Tara's palaces. Would be associated with his design. He dedicated. Uh, one area to Gráinne from the uh, Gráinne was a princess and Cormac's daughter and he built the royal seat of Roth Narihtak Cormac which is named for him at Tara it was al also in the period of Cormac MacArt's rule that the expulsion of the Daishi took place they go on to become a notable power in Munster also interesting is that a, a Daishi branch left Ireland and settled in Wales, colonized Wales in this period, and would found the Kingdom of Diffid, which was possibly led by the Elihan, or the Olions, from Munster. And they, that, that would culminate in the, the Tudor dynasty much later. The next High King of Ireland is Carbra Lifcar, the lover of the Liffey. Ardry from 267 to 284 AD. He married Anya, who was the daughter of Finn McCool. He raised a huge army against the Fianna, with uh, Gol MacMorna betraying him. Uh, but the Munster and the day she sided with Fianna, with the Fianna, with Finn McCool. And uh, he, Carbara, is killed by Oscar, who's Finn's grandson. Oscar is, of course, known to everyone as the Hollywood statue. This is where Oscar comes from.
He's Finn McCool's grandson. In fact, Carbara Lifkar is the name of the lion of the MGM studios. So Hollywood, it comes from a name of a, a village in Ireland. It also comes from Druid magic with the holy wood, which is a wand. The lion was actually filmed in Dublin Zoo. Before we meet Oscar again, we're going to meet Oshin, who is a, another progenitor of an entire canon of saga and epic, um, both in Ireland and Scotland. Very important effect on European Romanticism, would be a favorite of Napoleon, was depicted in paintings all across Europe. As a boy, he is found by Finn McCool, his father, after being raised in the wild also. This is also the origin of the Tarzan myths. He's a, he was found at Ben Bulben, associated with uh, William Butler Yeats, whose grave is found near there. He uh, grows into manhood as a poet warrior, and the romance of Oshin and Neve is very important in the development of Irish spirituality. He's associated with uh, Tirnanog, which is the emerald city of the land of youth. It's the faraway fairy land, it's heaven. He has an affair with Manananon MacLear's daughter, Neve. Oshin and Neve have an affair, go off to the land of everlasting youth, and she gives birth to Oscar and Plorimamon. And then Oshin's return to Ireland uh, will become a major work in the Irish compromise between paganism and Christianity, which he will help to negotiate with St. Patrick. Before we get to that, though, we'll return to Oscar, Oshin, and Neve's son. He defeated the king of the world in one of the sagas called Bruin Kirhan. Um, this was referenced by uh, John Cameron. Oscar was for a moment the king of the world when he had that victory. In Cah Gaura, the saga, he, Oscar, kills the high king Carbara, but is himself mortally wounded. And as Oscar dies, Finn Makul, the old great Fenian warrior, weeps as he had never done before. This uh, image is also of the dying Gaul, Oscar represents also that imagery of the dying Gaul, which is one of the precedent images of European spirituality. The dying Gaul is um, associated with uh, Brennus, and he would sack Rome, and he would have a great treasure at Toulouse. He was the conqueror of Greece and Rome, and then goes into Anatolia and conquers that area that we think of as Turkey today and establishes Galicia, which will become a major center of spirituality, also associated with the Phrygians, who wore Druidic robes, as we see with monks, and also informed uh, the New Testament with letters to the Galicians. Part of this includes an understanding of the dying Gaul, or the dying king of the nation that the empire conquers. The empathy and pathos that people have from Gaul for their former king is owned by the empire, which understands that empathy and tries to mitigate it and also make it spiritual so that it doesn't become a political threat. And so the, the dying Gaul is a precedent for the dying Hebrew. So you can see that part of the imagery has precedence with Oscar before Christianity uh, conquered that spirituality and in some ways conquered it by fusing the dying Gaul imagery with the dying Hebrew imagery so that the pity for the dying Gaul or Oscar uh, became pity for the dying Hebrew or Jesus. Uh, we're, we're getting on through the timeline now in 285 AD to 322. Fiecha Shroptena is the high king and he comes from Khan's line, and he reclaims his father's throne. His father was Karbara, the Lion of the Liffey. Uh, the tribes MacMahon, O'Hanlon, O'Carroll, Maguire are associated with him. This is again Connell Clark, who founded Cashel and built it. Um, he's the patronym also of Cork City, 
And this is his wife, Mong In, or Finn, Mong Finn. She's part of a, another Shakespearean type of drama where for power poisoned the high king in order to install her son. Her evil becomes uh, understood as a, as a warning, but also as part of the older pagan spirituality where her memory is maintained at Fela Mongane, uh, which is a celebration of Samhain or Halloween at her place of memory, which is uh, Krok Sauna or the Hill of Sauna or the Hill of Halloween uh, in County Limerick. So the festival is associated with her problematic reign. Uh, Crimhin Moor or the Great Fox ruled from 365 to 376 AD. He gained territory in Britain and Gaul. And Bat's Castle in Dunster or Somerset was constructed by the Olions who are related. He's the he's the king whom uh, Mong In or Mong Fin uh, poisoned. The next uh, great king is Nile of the Nine Gilach. Nile of the Nine. He's the Ardri Naharan from 378 to 405 AD. Uh, the, the great O'Neill family get their name from him. Nine submissions to Nile were from each of Ireland's five provinces. From Scotland, from the Saxons, from the Welsh, and from the Franks. The king before Nile's sons come into power is uh, Dahi, or Nahi, Akfiakra who's associated a saga on the continent of Europe where he is struck by lightning in the Alps. We're now entering into the Patrician era when St. Patrick comes to Ireland and uh, begins the process of resolving Gaelic paganism to what will become Celtic Christianity. And uh, he can be seen as the apostle of European Christianity generally because the form of Christianity that developed in Europe from the time of St. Patrick to the time of St. Malachy 500 years later is uh, the period of the development of European nations and vernacular literature and other places where the descendants of St. Patrick would uh, proselytize uh, this new religion and also bring writing and books to uh, formerly pagan people. So now we meet the sons of Nile, and these include uh, King Leary or Leary MacNeil, uh, the Ardry of Ireland from 428 to 458. He was uh, a fierce and pagan emperor. Dun Leary in Dublin is named for him. The, the, the story of the conversion of Ireland from paganism to St. Patrick is an entire epic itself and includes a, a magnificent history of the development of stone schools and architecture that created a literature not just in Ireland but across Europe. So what we're going to do is proceed with the timeline of the kings and go through the centuries until we get to King Brian. We'll explore the history of the Celtic Church in Ireland and its spread across Europe in another video. Uh, we're now going to meet the Sons of Nile. This is Conal Golbin, uh, is the founder of Tyr Conal, uh, which is Donegal, and he's one of the eight princes of Nile. Ben Bulbin is actually named for him in Sligo, so Ben Bulbin might be called uh, Ben uh, Conal. He was the first noble baptized by St. Patrick, and his conversion led to the conversion of Irish royalty. And some of the tribes associated with him include the O'Doherty, the O'Donnell, the Davitt, the Hempson, the McBride. Another of the sons is Carber MacNeil, or Carberry. He was leader of the conquest that established the O'Neill in the Midlands of Ireland. Another of his sons is Fiachu MacNeil, who is the conqueror of Meath. Um, Saint Patrick visited Fiachu and his brother Enda at Oshnach, but Fiachu refused baptism from the saint. He was opposed in Leinster by the Offaly tribes, and he defeated them in 514, winning the Plain of Meath, which is defined as being between Wishnach and, and Burr, 
which would become associated with the Offaly and St. Brendan later. Another of the sons is Yon MacNeil, who was the founder of Alloch and later Tyrone or Tyrone. His uh, burial place lies in Inishon in, in County Donegal. Fidelm and Etna uh, were the first princesses to be converted by St. Patrick. They uh, accepted St. Patrick's religion at the well of Klebach. Conal Kremhine, the first king of Ishnuchen in Meath, Patrick blessed Connell during a meeting at Taltu. We're not going to proceed through the history of Irish Christianity and the Celt and the building of the Celtic Church. Irish built schools and churches all across Europe. We're going to instead proceed through the king list and introduce some of the characters that, that come up, such as the Irish princess Isult from Tristan and Isult. She's a princess of the Igenacht, the, the daughter of Angus MacNad Froch the daughter of uh, the Munster Prince Angus, uh, who ruled from the royal seat of Cashel. Her lover is killed by the jealous king of Cornwall, and she's buried in uh, Chapel Izid in Dublin. The Tristan and Isolde uh, would reinvigorate European Romanticism in the 19th and 20th century. Alil Molt, or the Ram, was high king from 459 to 478. He was a member of the Kanachta, but most of the High Kings will be O'Neill up until uh, Brian Brew. Now, the, the law system in Ireland, which had been Brehan law and was a highly developed form, is now codified with uh, patrician Christianity, and that law system is called the Shanachas Mar, or the Great Legal Tracts of Ancient Ireland. And they're organized in triads, which is a, a pagan form of the synthesis of antithesis and thesis. Another approach is that any singularity is described in triplicate. It has a, therefore a druid and a Christian approach and is a, an important synthesis or strategy of compromise between paganism and Christianity. But while the Shanachus Mar is the law of the land, other pagan systems persist in Irish letters and legal practice including uh, Breha Dain Kecht, which are the judgments of Dean Kecht. These are legal tracts from ancient Ireland. We tell fines and compensation for injuries intentional or unintended. Um, they're named for Dean Kecht, who was the Daedanian god of medicine and the father of Cian, who was the father of Lu. What's important about this is that he, it demonstrates that while the Shanachas Mar is the law of the land, as the persistence of pagan thought is still there. The next high king, Dermot MacCarroll, or Dermot MacCarroll, was the Ardry Naharan from 539 AD to 558. He built Clonmacnos, um, which was founded by St. Ciaran. Celtic Christianity would be organized in this way. His successors would be called Corab Ciaran, just as the successor of St. Patrick is Corab Fodric, so that these founders of the Celtic Church would create an institutional structure that would uh, persist to this very day. Dermot MacCarroll, he was inaugurated himself uh, by the Ban Fesh ritual, which is that where the High King marries the goddess of the land. So the persistence of, of pagan ritual uh, is seen with him though he would be the last High King to, to be inaugurated in that manner. Yoka MacDonald was Ardry Naharan, uh, High King of Ireland from 562 to 563. He was the first of the princes of Alloc to win the High Kingship. St. Columba should be mentioned in this. Uh, from 521 to 597 he lived and was the Apostle of Scotland. He was the patron saint of Derry. Uh, and with St. Patrick and St. Bridget as the patron saint of Ireland. His uh, Vita Columbae was written by Adamnon, who codified women's civil rights in the, the Khan, which is the uh, law of the innocents. And they, they call the Khan of Adamnon the Geneva Accords of Ancient Ireland. Shenachan Tarpesht is the chief poet of Ireland at this time, was the Olive Moor Aaron, just like the Ard Reed or the High Kingship, 
the chief poet of Ireland was an institution in itself. His work is preserved in the great book of Lacan. He is the one who convened the poets of Ireland to find the best version of the Toyn. So the Druids persist in the form of Christian monks and in poets such as himself. And this is institutionalized and made law by Aud Mac Anmarek, who convened the Convention of Drumket at Limavadi, uh, wherein he summoned the princes of Ireland to a parliament. It was convened in 575, St. Columba was present, and, and it was decided by this parliament that the bards of classical Gaelic culture should continue in vernacular work. St. Patrick also made that ruling when he described the pagan myths as instructive for good character. is a perfect example of, of the character of European Christianity. It, it wasn't fundamentalist. It was a synthesis of uh, the pre-existing history with the literature of Christianity. This can be seen in the laws that resulted, such as Orkecht Narir, which is a legal tract which defines social ranks. Uh, an important uh, canon of work that would emerge from Connacht comes from Prince Guara, um, who was Prince of Connacht in 622. He famously outdid the High King of Ireland with his generosity to the poor. And uh, this is described in the Proceedings of the Great Bardic Institution. So that what I've been describing with the Convention of Drumquet is seen in the stories of Prince Guara, who, in his generosity towards the, the bards, provides an exemplary model uh, for uh, the patronage that would sustain Irish arts as, a, as an essential aspect of kingship. And he was also the patron of the great scholar uh, St. Coleman MacDuch. He began his career in a cave in the Burren before he founded the monastery of Kilmacduch. And uh, to this day, there's an annual pilgrimage to Coleman's Hermitage. Donal II was the Ard Naharan from 624 to 639. At the Battle of Mag Ra, Donal defeated a large alliance to win the kingship. He succeeded by Dermot Mac Aud, 657. Uh, Dermot was the high king at, at what is described as the golden age of Middle Irish literature. One of the great examples of that I have described earlier was the Khan of Adamnan, or the Law of the Innocents. It begins with a dream, an ashling, where his mother appears in a vision and excoriates him for not protecting the women and children of Ireland. And in order to live up to what his mother is demanding, he codifies the Law of the Innocents, which is a cornerstone of Irish literature and law. The next Ardri to discuss is Fergal MacMaldun, um, the saga of Faustina, or the prophecies of Fergal, is about him. In, in this period, the Arda Chalice was produced, the Holy Grail of Irish art. Uh, the Holy Grail probably comes from the mythology of Bran and the cauldron of everlasting life. You can see depicted on the Gundestrup cauldron also, where the god dips the dead in the cauldron to regain life. This is uh, repeated in stories of uh, the Daedanin, where the Dahada's cauldron is used to restore warriors that are killed in battle. And so the Holy Grail is both a depiction of uh, medicine, but also of uh, family health and the uh, survival of, uh, of a people. The next is Aud Allen. He met with the Iganacht uh, of the South on neutral ground and was able to achieve a unity of Ireland under a patrician law uh, where Cashel recognized Armagh as the central court of, of Ireland at the time. The High King of Ireland in 739 AD was Donal MacMurkada, and he's a major patron of the Celtic Christian Church. Uh, particularly uh, Duro Abbey, uh, which is where he's buried, and that's his high cross.
Niall Frosach was Ard Ri Naharan in 759 AD. His judgments are referenced in a poem 800 years later by a, a poet named Tolgana. Showers of silver and honey and wheat fell on his home where he was born in, in Tyr Conal. Niall of the Callan was High King Ard Ri Naharan 833. He defeated Viking raiders at Ma Niha in Donegal in 845. And he held a Ri Dal, or a parliament, at Ma Nochter near Clonacurry in 838 AD. His wife was Gormla, Ard Van Ri Naharan, Ard Van Rien, the High Queen. Uh, she died in 861, and the notice of her death in the annals of Ulster calls her a most charming queen of the Irish. The next Ardri Naharan is Flan of the Shannon, Flan the Shinana, who ruled from 879 to 916 AD. That's his high cross. In 902, Flan of the Shannon drove the Vikings from Dublin and won back the city for the Gaelic hegemony of Ireland. The Prince of Munster at that time was Cormac MacCullanan, became canonized as a saint. He was a great scholar and he commissioned an encyclopedia in 903 AD. He was defeated by the High King Flan, who we met earlier. Just as Flan defeated the Vikings, he also brought Munster again into line with the rest of Ireland. He, and Flan has a saga associated with him called Flan over Ireland or Flan for Ireland. Dublin was, as I said, liberated in 902 by Flan. Uh, who organized a joint force of princes. But after that victory, the Vikings would have a, a short uptick at Waterford in 914 and Limerick in 915. And uh, Citric in 917 was able to invade Dublin again. At the Battle of Island Bridge, the Vi Citric had a victory over High King Niall Glundov. It was the only Viking victory against the High Kingship of Ireland. After that victory, Citric left for England. In response to the death of High King Niall Glundov, Donal O'Neill, 956-980, he was a very effective ruler who introduced a number of needed military reforms. And in 980, he abdicated and entered the monastery at, at, at Armagh. And it, it may have been in order that a much more powerful warrior come to the throne in the form of Maliki MacDonald. Maul Shacknell MacDonald. Maliki MacDonald was High King of Ireland from 980 to 1002 AD. He had the great victory at Tara against Olaf Curran in 980. So the, the Vikings had Dublin from 902 to 980, but the Gaelic Irish regained it with the liberation of the slaves of Dublin at the Battle of Tara. Following this, the Battle of Clontarf would take place, where the High King of Ireland would defeat the Vikings and restore the Gaelic hegemony of Ireland. That victory was had by the High King Brian Beru. Ardri in the Heron from 941 to 1014 AD. He was the emperor of the Irish, the Imperator Scotorum, who bestowed Irish surnames on the people of Ireland who have them to this very day.